It's the 20th of October and a lot's happened in Parliament this week. Bills have been proposed, debates have raged and laws have passed. Parliament has the power to touch all aspects of our lives. So let's talk about what happened this week in Parliament. This video was made possible by our Patreon backers. Find out more and donate at thisweekinparliament.com. This week was far busier than last, with MPs in the House of Commons scheduled to vote on seven different topics. These include cold weather payments, council tax, overseas voters, the University of London, waterway management and pensions. We won't be going into all of those topics as it's pretty niche to dive into the details of waterway management or the technicalities of the University of London. We've linked to all of the debates below so if you want to jump into them you can, but we've stuck to the biggest, most consequential bills. In addition to the votes, the House also discussed bullying and harassment in Parliament, universal credit and childhood obesity. But first, let's start with the votes. The first thing set to be voted on was the Offensive Weapons Bill, which was supposed to reach its third reading in the Commons on Monday. However, all didn't go to plan as the vote ended up being rescheduled. A bit of background into this bill. It's a bill with a pretty broad scope, with the general objective of making the public safer by banning a number of offensive weapons which weren't previously outlawed. This includes banning the possession of weapons such as knuckle dusters, rapid fire rifles and zombie knives. This bill also aims to ban the possession of certain corrosive substances while in public places, as well as banning the sale of certain acids to people under the age of 18. This only scrapes the surface of what was covered by the bill, and we'll go into more depth about it in future videos. As I said at the start, this was supposed to reach its third reading in the Commons on Monday. So what happened? It was announced on Monday that instead of being debated that day, it will be considered tomorrow. Interestingly, in Parliament, tomorrow doesn't actually mean tomorrow. Deputy Speaker Dame Rosie Winterton went on to clarify that while the government has put the bill down for tomorrow, that does not mean that it will be taken tomorrow. It's a matter for the government when they bring the bill back. Labour MP Valerie Vaz responded, stating the importance of the bill, which is designed to help protect people. She asked, could the Leader of the House come to the House at her earliest convenience, when she's not buying pizzas for everyone, and inform us when this matter will be taken in the chamber? The Leader of the House, Andrea Leadsom, returned to the House on Thursday where she rescheduled the bill for next Monday. Which is good news for me, as I can just reuse the whole explanation section of this week's video in next week's video. On Tuesday, the MPs did actually get round to voting on some things. In fact, Tuesday was a busy day in the House of Commons, with the House voting on five matters. First up was the issue of the Cold Weather Payments Bill. This was a 10-minute motion bill introduced by Plaid Cymru MP Highwall Williams. The TLDR of this bill is that those claiming certain benefits get £25 a week in cold weather payments when temperatures go below zero degrees for seven days or more. The problem Highwell sees with this is that the weather stations used to measure the temperatures are often a long way from people's homes and are regularly close to the coast where the weather is generally warmer. In addition to this, the cold weather payments only apply until March, meaning that any temperature drops in often cold April and May aren't covered by the payments. Highwell is calling for annual reports to be published on the matter to allow the government to engage properly in an informed and open debate on the system's future. Parliament didn't object to the bill at its first reading, and as such it will face a second reading in November. Remember last week when I asked if you wanted us to make a video explaining how the systems of readings and the passage of bills worked in the UK? Well I heard you loud and clear. We'll be making that video in the coming weeks, so make sure you're subscribed and signed up to the This Week in Parliament newsletter to be notified when that video comes out. The Overseas Electors Bill was a bill surrounded by a surprising amount of drama. Currently, British expats lose their right to vote in the UK once they've lived overseas for 15 years or more. This bill is looking to completely remove that limit, allowing British citizens living overseas to vote in parliamentary elections regardless of how long they've lived abroad. The bill, which was sponsored by Conservative MP Glyn Davies, had its finances discussed and voted on this week. The Labour Party put forward an amendment to the bill, limiting the budget associated with the legislation to £10,000 a year, a huge reduction from the estimated £1 million needed annually to implement the bill. Conservative MP Chloe Smith called the amendment a blocking amendment and a wrecking amendment, saying it would do nothing less than stop the policy from taking effect. Chloe Smith went on to say that the bill was wrong as a matter of principle, saying, In no electoral system do the government set out how much they plan to spend on registering electors and then register only that many accordingly. That is not how we run our democracy. 
She then highlighted that overseas voters were already one of the most underrepresented groups, with only about 20% of eligible voters registered. Labour MP Jo Platt defended her party's amendment, saying that they were trying to strike the right balance between democracy and upholding the integrity of elections in the UK. She highlighted that until 2015, the number of overseas voters never exceeded 35,000 people. But in the 2017 election, a record 285,000 overseas voters took part in the election, an increase of 800%. She said that this increase created heavy administrative challenges for local authorities, as registering each voter takes an estimated two hours. She said that this was taking such a toll that after last year's general election, the Association of Electoral Administrators contracted the Hospital and Medical Care Association to provide members with free access to a confidential counselling service. Platt questioned how we've got to the point where free counselling is being offered to election teams in the aftermath of a national poll. Going on to say that the government's decision to abolish the 15-year rule without addressing those serious concerns is irresponsible to the extreme. Smith said that the opposition talk of the need to give a voice to the underrepresented is a theme that they like, but here they're blocking measures that do just that. But Chloe Smith's fiery remarks didn't stop there. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald, MP for the SNP and generic looking apprentice candidate, asked, If I decide to go and live outside the United Kingdom, could I register to vote in Pimlico where I currently rent a flat and be an electorate in that constituency? To which Smith responded, Yes. I think it's basically the Honourable Gentleman's deepest wish that he should live outside the UK. As I understand it, that's the point of the Scottish National Party. Anyway, when it came to a vote, the House was divided, but ultimately, with 259 eyes and 296 noes, Labour's amendment was rejected. Before we move on, if you're enjoying this series, I'd recommend that you sign up to our newsletter. We all know that the YouTube subscription system kind of sucks, and you don't always see everything you're subscribed to. If you subscribe to the This Week in Parliament newsletter, we'll email you once a week with a summary of the week's news and a link to our latest This Week in Parliament video. As always, Parliament discussed a lot more than just the votes. Some of the key topics discussed in Parliament this week include bullying and harassment of parliamentary staff, universal credit and childhood obesity. Bullying and harassment in Parliament was one of the biggest topics in the Commons and in the news this week. The Leader of the House of Commons, Andrea Leadsom, led a debate on Monday which reflected on the findings of the Cox Report, a report which looked into the issues related to harassment in Parliament. In her opening remarks, Leadsom commented, Over the past year, we have all been shocked and appalled by the reports of bullying, harassment and sexual harassment in Westminster, and I'm determined to stamp it out. The findings of this report are undeniably worrying, and they reflect poorly on the systems in the House of Commons. She told the House that a new independent complaints and grievances policy was introduced to Parliament in July, as well as two independent helplines. The report and its discussion gains mainstream attention largely due to the accusations made against Speaker of the House and Conservative MP John Burko. Fellow Conservative MP James Dudrich commented on the issue, saying, This is a disturbing report which identifies a number of unacceptable behaviours. Page 64 lists some of them. Taunting, mocking, mimicking, deliberately belittling in front of other members, making offensive personal comments about appearance, belittling someone's junior status, and making lengthy and humiliating tirades of criticism and abuse in front of colleagues. How can we encourage Mr Speaker to stop this behaviour? James Dudrich is one of a number of Conservatives criticising Burko, with a number calling for his resignation. At the time of this recording, Burko has yet to resign, but it's been reported that he's told a number of friends that he'll resign in summer 2019. A parliamentary spokesman said that the Speaker was elected to the House in 2017 for the course of the Parliament. In the event that he has something to say on his future plans, he'll make that announcement to the House first. Universal credit was another major issue, both in Parliament and in the news this week. A quick recap of universal credit. Universal credit is a plan to replace six types of benefits. Income-based job seekers allowance, income-related employment and support allowance, income support, child tax credit, working tax credit, and housing benefit. Turning all six benefits into one. The goal is to remove the so-called benefit strap, a situation where people are discouraged from working as they'd be better off just staying on benefits. Universal credit is a means-tested benefit and is designed for working-age people who are both looking for work or already work but earn a low income. 
Minister of Employment and Conservative MP Alok Sharma started his remarks on Wednesday saying, There's been a great deal of speculation about universal credit in the past few days. I cannot and will not comment on the speculation. Well that's a great way to ruin the fun of this video Alok. He went on to say that when it comes to the rollout, we have long said that we will take a slow and measured approach to managing migration, which is why we'll continue to take a test and learn approach. I'm falling asleep in my own video here. However, to be fair, when it comes to big issues like benefits, it does make sense to ensure that everything's working in a measured way. However, listening to Alok, you believe that universal credit isn't as interesting as the headlines made it look. Labour MP Margaret Greenwood did raise an interesting issue, accusing the government of contradicting themselves. First we were told that austerity is over, then that families on low income are at danger of losing as much as £200 a month as a result of transferring to UC. Next, the Prime Minister said that nobody would be worse off, but the Secretary of State contradicted her the following day, confirming that some families would be worse off. How many households currently claiming legacy benefits will be worse off between now and 2023 as a result of making a claim for UC? Hallock responded, It's interesting that the Honourable Lady talks about confusion. Let me be absolutely clear. There's no confusion on the government benches. The confusion is on the opposition benches. Okay, okay. Now I see Alok making this a bit more interesting. The Shadow Chancellor talks about abolishing universal credit, and others talk about reforming it. There's no clarity at all from the opposition. They oppose everything, but they have the solution to nothing. Okay, so now this is getting a little more interesting, but here's where it really takes the turn. Labour attempted to force the governments to release the Whitehall analysis of how universal credit would affect household incomes. Labour's concern is that many families will be thousands of pounds worse off under the new system, and as such they want to see the government's internal documents which examine the impact of universal credit. On Thursday, Labour MP Margaret Greenwood tabled a humble address. This is a rarely used technique where MPs ask the Queen to instruct ministers to release the documents in question. Due to the weirdness of the UK's system of government, if the Queen requests the documents, they must be released. She commented that due to the speculation and confusion, many people are worried about how the changes would impact their family, and as such, the government had a duty to publish their data and reveal what could happen. In the end, the motion to have the documents released was close but unsuccessful, with 299 no's and 279 eyes. Finally, on Tuesday, Conservative MP and wannabe TV star Nadine Dorries brought the issue of childhood obesity to the House. In Nadine's opening remarks, she discussed what she'd learned on her latest TV project about childhood obesity, observing that the UK is now the third most obese nation in the world, saying that this is a crisis, and as always when there is a crisis, the innocent victims are the children. She advocated for a joined-up, cross-organisational and cross-departmental study to solve the problem, which is currently costing the taxpayer more than £30 billion a year, as well as the lives of a future generation. Sorry to distract from the importance of childhood obesity, but am I the only one that didn't know that Nadine had written an absolute boatload of books? I know now I've mentioned her TV show and her books, but I promise TLDR isn't funded by Nadine Dorries. It's funded by you, on Patreon. Sorry, that's a plug I'll save for a tiny bit later. That's it for our second episode of This Week in Parliament. This series is in the trial phase with two more episodes guaranteed. We were overwhelmed with the positive feedback you gave us about last episode, so we'd really like to be able to make more episodes. I'll discuss the issues around making more videos in the future, but essentially, This Week in Parliament takes up a lot of time, and so far at least, hasn't been returning much both in terms of financials and in view count when compared to our other videos. So if you want to help me balance this equation and make more This Week in Parliament videos, make sure to subscribe to our Patreon and kick a few pounds our way. Also, we're still deciding on our next Brexit Explained video topic. So if you're really quick and donate $3 or more before the poll closes, you can have your say. If you can't donate to us on Patreon, that's absolutely fine. Sharing these videos with others and enjoying them yourself means the world to me, so thank you even if you can't donate. If you do want to keep up to date with the goings on in Parliament and our videos, subscribe to our channel and the This Week in Parliament newsletter, which we will use to email out updates on Parliament every week. There's a link to the newsletter in the description.